Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second of our spring Jane Jacobs lectures. We are the Center for the Living City. Launched by a group of activists, practitioners, and academics in 2005, the Center for the Living City holds the singular distinction of being the only urbanist organization founded in collaboration with Jane Jacobs. In the years since its founding, the Center has become the leading global urbanist organization, advancing social, environmental, and economic justice forms are the core of its purpose. Center works to invite all perspectives, particularly those of the marginalized, to participate in the creation of solutions that are empathetic, responsive, and community-based. So I before we uh, introduce our panelists and this wonderful lecture, I just need to thank Mary Wood University's School of Architecture for hosting us. This is where we are coming to you from right now in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the birthplace of Jane Jacobs. And also thank you to Northeastern Pennsylvania's AIA um, for sponsoring this lecture in collaboration with Mary Wood University School of Architecture. So today we have a great talk from two of our board members from the Center for the Living City. One of those is our original, one of our founders. Um, and we are going to enjoy a conversation between Sanford Akita Akita and Roberta Brandis Grants. The conversation will be about a city that cannot be a work of art. This is um, a really new, a wonderful new book by Sandy. Um, and uh, this is the excerpt of the book that they will be discussing. Um, and that we're going to drop in our chat a link to it. It's Sandy's made it available to everyone to download. So a city cannot be a work of art. Jane Jacobs is a legend in the field of urban, urbanism and is famous for challenging and profoundly influencing urban planning and design. What can and should be learned from Jacobs' contributions to economics and social theory? These are central to her criticisms and proposals for public policy, but are frequently overlooked even by her most enthusiastic admirers. Jacobs' insight that a city cannot be a work of art, quote, underlies both her ideas on planning and her understanding of economic development and social cooperation. So again, this lecture will be a conversation before San between Sanford Ikea, Sandy, and R Roberta brandis -Gratz, one of the original founders of the center. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Sandy and Roberta, and then I'm going to let them have the conversation. I'm going to let Roberta take it from there. Sandy Stanford Ikea is a professor emeritus at Purchase College the State University of New York, a fellow of the Colloquium on Market Institutions and Economics Process at New York University, and serves on the boards of the Economic Freedom Institute, Cosmos Plus Taxes, and the Center for the Living City. He is the author of The Dynamics of the Mixed Economy from 1997. His research focuses on the interconnections among cities, spontaneous social orders, entrepreneurial development, and urban policy. Again, to learn more about the book that Sandy's recently authored, A City Cannot Be a Work of Art, please check it in the chat. And also it's on our um, registration page for this lecture. Roberta Brandis Gratz. Roberta is an award-winning journalist, an urban critic, an international lecturer and author, and was voted one of Planet Zian's top 100 urban thinkers in 2011. Her most recent book, We're Still Here, You Bastards, How the People of New Orleans Rebuilt Their City, She's also the author of The Battle for Gotham, New York in the Shadow of Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs, The Living City, Thinking Small in a Big Way, and Cities Back from the Edge, New Life for Downtown. Roberta is also one of my heroes, and I am so happy that she is here today to talk with Sandy. And um, what we're going to do is I'm going to disappear and let Roberta and Sandy take it from here. Well, there you will have their conversation for about 45 minutes. And please, during this talk, drop your questions into the Q&A. We'll come back on and take them at the end. So Sandy, Roberta, thank you both so very much. Thank you, Maria. Uh, welcome, everybody. I first met Sandy when I found him teaching a course on Jane Jacobs economics at Purchase College in Westchester, New York. I had never heard of anyone actually teaching Jacobs economics, and yet Jane considered her economic writing her most important. 
Today, many communities, large and small, pride themselves on designing their community, a la Jane Jacobs. Most people don't even realize that so many of the ideas today, mixed use, diversity, bike lanes, small parks, and more, do emanate from Jane's writing. But Jane's ideas about economics have not been similarly embraced. I strongly recommend to everyone reading The Economy of Cities, which Jane considered her most important book, and The Nature of Economies, Nature of Economies, which came later. When you read in the first one the examples of how new work begins, it's very accessible reading, you will gain a whole new understanding of your city or community. And when you read Jane's parallels between economies and nature in the second, again, your understanding of everything will expand. When she explains why Manchester succeeded and Birmingham did not, how Detroit and Rochester grew and then failed, how the manufacturing of bikes evolved in Japan, or the development of the bra started, you'll really understand how good development happens. There is never anything political in Jane's ideas. She was always amused that both the left and the right claimed her. Sadly, has, Sandy has now written this incredible detailed book, A City Cannot Be a Work of Art, Learning Economics and Social Theory from Jane Jacobs. It is rich in detail and accessibly and accessible free on the internet. So I would recommend you dig in for all or part of what interests you most. Sandy will tell us how to do that. So I want to start today's dialogue, it will be a dialogue, by asking Sandy to explain how he began his journey to teaching Jane's economics and when he first discovered Jane's writing. Sandy? Yeah, thank you. Um, I can give you kind of a, a long, but I think necessary answer to that, if I may. Um, my uh, PhD in economics came from New York University, and um, it was in 1986, so a little while ago. So I'm, you know, trained uh, as a mainstream economist. Um, I had a, a great deal of uh, formal and mathematical uh, training in not only uh, mathematics and calculus and things like that, but also in, in uh, statistics and econometrics. Um, so, you know, it's it's more or less the same uh, now as it was then, uh, highly quantitative. And, and the emphasis uh, was on <clears throat> creating models of, of markets or economies that um, depended on some very very stark uh, extreme assumptions in order to get the, the models to work uh, properly. That is to say, in order to have an answer or a, a determinate solution. And one of the um, most uh, stringent assumptions that models tend to make then and, and now even in a large measure is to assume that um, nobody makes mistakes. It's to assume that the, the that agents or the people that you're trying to model, whether it sits in a, in a market or an economy, are um, either uh, not making any mistakes, they have, they have uh, perfect information, or they're making the, the same kind, they're making the same mistake. So that you can address it, uh, you know, as, as if they were a relatively simple problem. And um, the, the economics that I was interested in is was and still is very much at odds with that. Uh, um, I'm influenced by the uh, thinkers that descend from uh, Karl Menger, uh, University of Vienna, and um, Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, and my great teacher at NYU is Israel Kirzner. And the assumption there is that people are not perfectly informed. And that um, people who are motivated but not perfectly informed as long as the rules of the game are in place that allow them to uh, trade and to uh, discover uh, to experiment 
um, you know, they'll find their way to something that is close to what economists call equilibrium. That, you know, where, where all plans are coordinated and, and you're not making any mistakes. And the idea is you're never going to get there, right? The world is full of people who, uh, all of us who are not perfectly informed. So we're going to make mistakes. So the, the problem that the economist and social theorist has to fa face is given this imperfection, um, how is it that we ever get our plans coordinated? How, how is it that, that, that it happens? Yeah, and so that uh, I wrote my dissertation on uh, actually antitrust theory, antitrust economics, and um, antitrust law. And I, you know, at, at NYU, and at the same time, I I went to you know the Stan Scran Bookstore, Roberta, and uh, where is it, Broadway and Twelfth Street. We used to hang out there. Um, so also Barnes and Noble, I think, had a, a remainder store on Fifth Avenue. Anyway, I picked up a copy of Death and Life because somebody said, "Hey, you should." You know, have this uh, on your bookshelf, and uh, so I, yeah, I got I got, got a copy, like a dollar or something, of uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities, and it sat on my bookshelf for like a decade. So <clears throat> finally, um, around nineteen ninety eight, ninety nine, after I published my first book, which was on public policy failures. Uh, based on imperfect knowledge and the kinds of things that I was just talking about, uh, two two people uh, told me. Well, one was Pete Bedke from uh, uh, George Mason University. He said, "Hey, Sandy, why don't you apply your uh, policy analysis to uh, urban uh, context?" Now, I guess he was thinking about housing and things of that nature, land use. And at the same time, my colleague up in Canada. Uh, Pierre de Rocher at the University of uh, Toronto, Mississauga, said, Hey, you should read Jacobs if that's what you're interested in. So I did. I finally pulled this book off the shelf and uh, started reading. And I was struck immediately by how much it resonated with the um, economic concerns and approach that I had uh, about imperfect knowledge and processes, experimentation and order emerging uh, given the right rules of the game and so forth. Uh, so it it resonated. And then there were two or three things, however, that really struck me in reading Death and Life. One was, well, in addition to, to how closely I felt uh, Jane Jacobs was, her approach was to the one that I was um, describing, but also how what she was talking about filled in a lot of gaps in what's called the market process approach, that we're entrepreneurial competition, you look for opportunities, given imperfect information, and you make discoveries and you, you can is that uh, put things together. Is that the Jane Shaker, the economy of cities or just death and life? That was the death and life. Okay. Death and life for great American cities, yeah. Sorry. I'm, so did you then go to the background. Did you then go to the... Uh, uh, Jane's uh, economic and uh, the economy of cities. Oh, I did, I did, but um, just even from death and life, you you know, I got a sense that okay, there's a there's a a, a you know intellectual companion. Uh, so she filled in a lot of gaps institutionally about what are how entrepreneurship works and the located it in an urban context. Right? That was really really important. Uh, the other thing is. I noticed that there were gaps in her economics. She didn't have a price theory, for example. She didn't have a, she didn't have a theory of market. But but the you know my background and training and and uh, the market process framework uh, filled in those gaps. They're really really complementary. Complementary. People. Um, yeah, I'm, Robert. I'm glad you raised uh, the economy of cities, which is her second book, right, 1969. Um, but in Death and Life. In 1961, in the introduction to that, she says that uh, part one, which has to do with sidewalk ballet and eyes on the street and uses of sidewalks and so forth, is a necessary prerequisite to uh, part two, which she says deals with economics. And part two, she says, explicitly, is the most important part of the book right, because it deals with economics. And 
most people don't notice that. And so the, there's enough economics in death and life that um, you know you uh, get get a real sense of what our interests were. And then of course uh, the economy of cities, and followed by cities and local nations, 1984, I think, and then the nature of economies. And she wrote other books as well. But the emphasis, her the importance she attached to economics in her own thinking is obvious when you just read the titles of her book. So, sorry, that's a long answer, but that's how I got started. Well, I think you're right in uh, and call attention to the fact that economics really is at the heart of everything she was writing about, just even from day one. Um, but uh, the economy of cities was very explicit in how economies work and how markets work and how development works. Um, and uh, she uses wonderful examples. We all understand General Motors and and Rochester with Xerox and all of that. So uh, given that you can't assume that everyone listening has read Economy of Cities, please give us what you consider the most basic teaching in that book. Well, the, her emphasis, and really you can trace this back to death and life, but it, it, she's very explicit in the Economy of Cities that her concern with economics had to do with innovation. That innovation is um, the, the most important uh, phenomenon that economics can address. And you know, that's totally in, in, in line with you know my my own sort of prior disposition. I was saying before how the economics that I was trained in happened to be focused on uh, formal models where you reach an equilibrium where nobody's making mistakes. And once you reach a, that kind of equilibrium, there's no incentive to change what you're doing. That is to say, there's no room for innovation because if plans are perfectly coordinated, any change is going to make it imperfect, right? So, but she, so she rejected that approach as 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 I do, and and uh, many of my colleagues uh, were influenced by the same people uh, in, uh, reject it. Uh, and so, the the main message of that book is, uh, first of all, innovation is the most important part, most important thing to be studied. The second thing is, and we can go into the mechanics of that, but which are interesting and and non-standard. Uh, as you might expect. But the, the second thing is the first chapter of, of uh, the economy of cities is a story, is a um, sort of a uh, historical uh, narrative. It's not, it, it, it's not real history, but it's kind of, it's sort of a hypothetical history about how cities develop, how they emerge uh, spontaneously from trade, and then how innovations occur within those kinds of urban contexts that are also emergent and spontaneous. And she gives examples, and I know you're familiar with agriculture and animal husbandry. So cities um, are uh, initially, in, in her uh, the way she describes it, uh, driven by, established by traders. You have diverse people who under other circumstances might be either running away from each other or chasing each other. But if they have an incentive to, to associate, to trade goods that they may not have themselves, uh, then they'll, you know, they have through various mechanisms, uh, an incentive to get together at a certain place. And over time, that place becomes a settlement where traders come from all kinds of different areas. And the, the beauty of that is, um, and, and the reason why that promotes innovation is that number one, you have ideas and goods and ways of doing things coming from areas that you would not, normally not have contact with. And we see this today when we buy stuff from other cities and other places uh, that we can't get, get ourselves. So you have that. So it's it's not it's goods and also people come and they have ideas of different ways of 
of speaking, different beliefs, and that all gets mingled. So that, that kind of thing would not happen in the absence of large settlements with diverse peoples. The second thing that happens is that, well, you have this uh, uh, accumulation of, of different uh, inputs, if you will, uh, that uh, you can, you know, pools of, of efficient, uh, sorry, uh, effective pools of economic use is the phrase she uses in uh, Death and Life. Effective pools of economic use, this diversity of uses. Then you can discover new stuff, right? You, you can put together, this is where, where the uh, her story about the Japanese bicycle, you know, comes in and, you know, the uh, initially, they imported bicycles from the United States, but then in order to repair them, their local repair shops <laughs> and the local repair shops were able to put to, uh, create inputs, which, you know, you could assemble a new bicycle with locally, which fit, you know, local tastes better than the, than the imported and was cheaper. So that kind of thing happens. The, the discovery happens. And the second thing that happens is that knowledge gets diffused very quickly, that you have competitors who are watching you that, oh yeah, that's a great thing to do. I can do that the same way or better. Uh, so this is this is this is competition. So knowledge gets uh, um, concentrated, uh, gets uh, diverse knowledge gets concentrated in one place, and then discoveries can get diffused right away. Which in sparse settlements in a rural rural setting would not happen. Somebody may be a genius and discover something fantastic uh, right. in. Like in a small settlement, but then it gets lost or it gets isolated for a long time, doesn't spread. In a city, it happens just like that. Right, so, which is just, what in many ways defines a city. So let's jump to the present. Um, I personally don't know of anywhere that a city has been created by man. In other words, developers are always uh, trying to say, I'm going to build a new city. Um, Rouse did oh, yeah. it in Berlin, um, a couple of places. They've never worked as a city. They always wind up being the equivalent of a suburb. And sometimes they start with a little manufacturing or something that doesn't last. Mm -hmm. We have a new one that <laughs> spending a lot of money out in California to build a new city. Based on what you and I have learned from Jane, and I believe in everything she has written because it all shows itself to be true. It is not theory. It is uh, example, um, one right after the, uh, the other. Have you uh, seen anyone able to try to develop a city and if not why not why doesn't it work well let me answer it this way um conceptually um you can't build a city <laughs> i mean you, you can't build a city of innovation in at least at least the way that um that the uh, jacobs defines it and the way i like to think about it right that a city is a place of experimentation, of diversity, of, of movement, and so forth. If you try to plan a city, whether you're Corbusier or you're, you're, you're you know, Ebenezer Howard or, or uh, you're um, the uh, California, friend of, friend, whether you're yeah California or in Saudi Arabia, right? Neom, the line, uh, you're going to fail it, it conceptually because you 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 it's like Oh, I'm going to I'm going to build a human being, right? I have I have an arm, I have a leg, I have a brain, I have a heart from different people, and just put it together, right? Even if they're organic, right? It, it's not going to work right? because there's something missing. Uh, but what you can do, and what has happened, is that you can you can try you can establish uh, a location. Um, you know. Uh, if, if uh, you know, think, think of uh, a lot of a lot of the Roman cities were established as Roman outposts, uh, and they weren't intended to be cities. Uh, London may be one of them, right? But uh, they, over time, uh, they may have started off as fortresses. They may have started off as uh, the shrines or places you 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 go periodically uh, for for 
uh, have rituals and so forth. But once you've established a place, then it can get used for other things, right? So you're thinking, well, I want to, you know, I have where where's a good place to trade? Well, let's go to this 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 uh, fortress, or let's go to near there uh, because it's already established. It's it's a uh, it's a spot where everyone can uh, orient themselves, and so then spontaneously over time you evolution in an evolutionary process, it can become a city, right? London becomes a city. Uh, Venice becomes a, a city. New York, for that matter, uh, was but, uh, be becomes a city, but you, that becoming is not something that you can plan, right? I mean, you can, you can there's certain things you could do which would encourage uh, an evolution, right? You can, you can, um, you know, urban planning. Your what you try to do is is to define public spaces from private spaces, and then see, you know, you can see what happens uh, over time in those spaces. Uh, but you can't predict in any detail exactly what's going to happen. You'd you'd be you'd be uh, number one foolish to do that because things would be different. And number two, it's it's uh, conceptually impossible to do that. Uh, well, it's like trying to—it's like trying to predict who your baby, you know, is going to be when he or she is thirty years old. Well, one of the things that she points out that every settlement that emerged into a city had a purpose, and it—it it was an inherent purpose. Uh, it was at a waterfront, or a railroad crossing, or you know, something else but not at the whim of people with money. It needs to have an economic foundation. One of the my most favorite quotes from Jane, it was, is, you can't build the oven and expect the loaves to jump in. <laughs> and uh, you have to have something that starts to bake in an oven to become a loaf and multiple loaves. Mm -hmm. So uh, what would you say to these uh, very rich people in California who have a lot of money mm -hmm. and think they can start a new city and in the process they're disturbing an awful mm -hmm. lot of agricultural land people didn't want to give up. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you say to them? It, mm -hmm. Look, uh, look, guys, this is your idea. But just building buildings is not going to create a city. So what no, do you that, say? So that you're, I mean, that's it, right? You, the, a city is not just a physical structure. It's not, quote, unquote, the built environment. It's the relationship between the people who live there and that physical environment. Um, I, I have to confess, I'm not familiar with with what's going on in, in that specific instance in California. But I mean, you could you can look at the uh, Neom, as I mentioned, in, in Saudi Arabia. You can look at the, the ghost cities and and, and uh, People's Republic of China. Uh, you can look at uh, the attempts to. Well, one one example I should have given of something that you know may be a success is. Um, uh, well, Islamabad, you know, the capital of of uh, Pakistan or um, Brasilia, or the capital of Brazil. Not that they were successes as planned, right? They were planned uh, cities, but the thing is, because they are capital capitals, uh, the authorities could force all the civil servants to move there. So you you solve that problem. the The main problem of trying to build a city is is uh, that you a have to get people to want to go there and b you have to make people want to stay and so uh what uh, jane jacobs uh, uh, talks about in death and life as um uh primary diversity right primary uses excuse me uh, in a neighborhood that that is to say a use that will attract people into that neighborhood uh, like like residential or office spaces or schools or museums, things that will bring people from outside in applies also to cities as a whole. If you want to establish a city, you know, I would tell these people, um, you have to give people a reason 
to choose to go there. Okay, you can't, you, then, you know, you can force civil servants to, to, to move there and that might help a, a spark of success, who knows. But uh, otherwise, I, I have, you know, uh, friends who are uh, trying to uh, promote free cities, that is for the more private cities. And, and the problem there is also, how do you get what, you know, have to give people other than rich people <laughs> a reason to go there or else they're just club meds, right? Or else they're just right. resorts. They have, you, have to, you have to have places for people of all income level. Right. They want we, to have go a, there. we have a few of those and they're mostly tourist attractions or exactly. summer. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, so uh, essentially um, what you said is, is at the heart of a lot of what Jane writes. And that is, you can't plan for a city to happen. You can't plan to make it work. You can't plan, plan, plan. Now, she had great um, differences with the planning community. And even though um, in over time, there have been planners a branch of the planning community that has absorbed her thinking and knows that you can't, uh, you know, uh, move a neighborhood or change a neighborhood uh, that has emerged uh, right. on its own. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so th the question then becomes how what is it about the planning profession that uh, keeps, prevents them from seeing what actually works? Mm -hmm. They had great plans and Jane wrote about these wonderful plans. And when she went to the cities and, and saw that they were dead and she questioned the planners, they said, well, people aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So why has the planning community not caught up with the reality mm -hmm. that Jane writes about? Mm -hmm. but let me, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, let me, one, one reason, I, I attended a, uh, in, a, a, a conference in Europe uh, of European planners. And I, I gave a, a, a talk there and I was looking at the program and of the different sessions there were you know there were, uh, urban planners urban designers uh there were engineers uh, architects were, were, were present almost no economists i was almost the only economist at this conference there were hundreds of participants um and i noted that and uh about that time i i befriended an urban planner uh, who was the uh, uh, the chief urban planner for the world bank and uh, his name is uh, Alain Berthaud, and he recently published this book called Order Without Design. So it's, it's, I learned so much from this book. If I, I, I have said that if, if Jane Jacobs herself were actually a planner, this is the kind of book she would write, I think. It, it, he, he said that his, the main uh, thesis of, of his book is that urban planners should learn economics. And what he means by that is that they should understand land values. They should understand how how uh, cities serve as labor markets, uh, and that sort of informs uh, his, his outlook. And I think he's he's totally right about that. So one one way to answer your question about about planners is they don't really understand economics. They don't understand land values and real estate and uh, how different designs are going to impact markets, labor markets, and, and so forth. Um, well, they also don't understand the process of development and economic development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think one um, other distinction is uh, you know you can distinguish between urban planners. Oh, Robert, I think we you're frozen. Well, I'll keep talking. <laughs> you can get back with. Oh, there you go. Um, distinguish between urban planners. You know, like in, in the New York Planning Department, who who um, do do things like zoning and and different uh, uh, land use, versus urban designers. These are the Corbusiers. These are the you know, rights who are trying to design cities. Uh, and I think urban planners, as you say, 
uh, have learned a lot of lessons from Jacobs and people like Jacobs who are uh, not are many of how, them. I said only a only a few have learned. I, I know a few as well. Yeah, yeah, that, this is true. But I mean, certainly there are fewer Robert Moses or Ed Bacon's around in the United States. Abroad, that's a different story, right? In 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 China and the Far East and Middle East, it's, it's a totally different story. They haven't learned the lessons of of Jan Jacobs. We can talk about those things later. But I was saying that um, uh, the urban designers tend to have an architectural background, right? You design a building for a specific function, and you have to think very carefully about relation of you know uh, turning negative space into positive space in, in particular ways, and how different things put together. And you have to, be, you know. The good ones are brilliant. They're, they're the great, they're, they're, you know, the Geary's and pianos and so forth. They're, they're, they're brilliant. They're geniuses. But it, it's a, a, they, the the vision sometimes becomes unconstrained. That is to say, okay, you you can design a, a, a building because it has more or less a a specific purpose or set of purposes, right, which you can plan for. But if you expand that to even a block or a a, a neighborhood or a district. It's a totally new ball game because there your whatever complexity you're trying to design displaces spontaneous emergent complexity that happens unplanned over time. This is, in my book, I talk about this trade-off between planned complexity, design complexity versus spontaneous complexity. And what uh, uh, Jane Jacobs was primarily concerned about is not, not that you shouldn't plan or, or plan as an architect or or even as an urban planner but that you need to appreciate right the the uh the evolutionary character of cities the the messiness i, I like to talk about the messiness of cities because of the, the the trial and the error the attempts and the mistakes before you get to the successes and then you know it's ongoing uh, a city is never finished right a, a great city an innovative city is is uh, constantly moving. It's, it's dynamic and it's messy, and you have to be able to tolerate that. So, again, to answer your question, I think uh, a certain mindset, maybe it's an architectural mindset, just likes messiness. I mean, who likes messiness? But you have to kind of appreciate messiness because of what it is, right? It's the it's. I totally agree, and I and I agree that that's uh, a very fundamental point. Jane was making, but let's go to a specific place. Uh, it's in New York. I don't know how many of our uh, attendees are from New York, but it's a famous enough place that everybody will know about it. The Garment Center in New York. Now, one of the earliest things Jane just and wrote about is natural evolution of economic districts. She wrote about the flower district. She wrote about the fur district. Um, all of these districts emerged uh, totally naturally. They weren't planned. Uh, they come together in in a in a uh, an economy like the Garment Center. Have the dressmaker who needs a zipper, who needs trimming or whatever. They all come together. For years, the Planning Commission in New York has been nibbling away at the Garment Center because the developers love centrality, physical centrality neighborhood. It's 30s, near subways, all the right things. Um, and forever, they're saying, well, they can move to Brooklyn or whatever. Mm -hmm. Nibble by nibble, they have eroded the Garment Center. They haven't all moved to Brooklyn. A lot of them left town and, and moved to other places. They're now at it again. They're mm -hmm. bigger than ever plan because oh. of the need for, a social, for affordable housing. Is there a, a way that one can prevent nibble of these vital economic districts without destroying them with all this kind of planning well i that's a that's a very complex question i 
I don't think you can preserve a, a you know the garment district is is not what, what it was. I mean, obviously, and and for for, for uh, maybe for the reasons that you're discussing, but I don't think it it it, it um, would remain that way. I mean, in the same way that the uh, uh, you know Soho uh, you know remained the the, the cast iron. Uh, district and, and the uh, light in, in industrial district that it was. I mean, things evolve over time. I don't wait think you can- Wait a minute, wait a minute, Sandy. Soho was designated for a highway. That's yes. what killed. It did not die naturally. Yeah, well, I, my point is that, yeah, but there, there are, you know, uh, any number of places that uh, will not remain the same, right? Because industry changes, the, the, uh, the Supply changes, demand changes, and so I think it's a mistake to try to preserve the activity, the specific activity within a particular place. Um, I agree which, with which, you. Which, but that's not that. That's not the same thing. It's not preserving the activity, and I I have to say, as um, a member of a family that had a manufacturing company, it evolved as certain things mm -hmm. die or. Uh, you know, uh, in in um, in demand, that's a natural process, uh, mm -hmm. and, and and nobody was trying to preserve the manufacture of something that, that is no longer asked for. Um, garment industry may have been making dresses with long, long dresses when the short hem came in. They had, they adjusted to the demand of the economy, uh, and and I don't think you can preserve the actual uses. But when you inflict uh, and in and in uh, insert major new real estate into an area, you change the whole uh, metabolism of the area. Is that hmm. not true? Well, I. I Undoubtedly, right? that that's true. It 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 depends on um, who's doing it, right? Uh, and uh, with with the help of whom, right? If you have uh, the one of the uh, most effective ways to radically change a district on large scale is to combine public and private projects, right? Where you have a uh, a private developer, a series of private developers, who are uh, in uh, co who cooperate with the municipal government, right, to uh, use eminent domain, uh, issuance of, of municipal bonds, and so forth, to develop wide swaths of, of area which would not otherwise have have uh, been feasible in in a purely private context, right? It's just you know you couldn't afford it, so you need you need some sort of help in doing that. So if that that sort of thing. I think what's much more, um, maybe what you're getting at is a, a more uh, piecemeal uh, change of, of wanna, uh, a particular dare. I want to go back. I'm, I'm sorry, Roberta, I think I- I want to go back um, to your You're frozen. Huh. Oh. Well, I'm going to just keep talking, and okay. I assume you can hear me. Um, I can hear you. Uh, back to to your book. Okay, back to your book for a minute, and then I want to open up for questions. You call um, the the title of your book is a work of art, which you draw from Jane. What does that mean? Okay, let me read you the um, the passage. I have it as a uh, uh, quotation at the front of the book, but if I can find it, I've got my book right here. Uh, uh, this is this is my book, by the way. It, it's uh, free, downloadable. It's open access. at the link that was uh, provided earlier. So, in death and life, I think it's a chapter on visual order, although I. I not entirely sure, but I think it's there. She, um, she says the following. She says, when we deal with cities, we are dealing with life 
at its most complex and intense. Because of this, or because this is so, there's a basic aesthetic limitation on what can be done with cities. A city cannot be a work of art. Right. That's the that's the uh, quotation as a whole. So the idea is that, and she goes on to say that an artist abstracts from reality in order to uh, achieve a particular artistic purpose. But uh, you know, similar, I guess, I would say similar if an engineer wants to build a particular a machine for to serve a specific purpose. But that's not what a city is. A city, I mean, a city can be beautiful. You can, you know, art and and uh, artists uh, can can certainly make cities look more beautiful. But the city as a whole cannot be a work of art in the sense of being planned, as you were saying before, or the in, intention of a in, single individual or group of individuals. I thought it was a perfect okay. quote. Um, yeah. You want to start taking questions? Hi, Mar Maria. Hey, hey, everybody. Sure. Or wherever. Yeah, we have. Um, I'm, I'm. I'm not sure Roberta is aware that her. We're, we're having reception problems. Yeah, we we could hear one another. I think it's maybe something happening on your side, Roberta, but. We're gonna we're gonna ask I'm gonna ask Sandy some of the questions that came through. For, did we lose her? Maybe we lost her. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sandy. So um, that's unfortunate. Hopefully, she comes back. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm... Yeah, we have a bunch of really interesting ones here for you. So in your book, you argue against the notion of cities as works of art, Sandy. Right? A city cannot right. be a work of art in your book. So this. Um, person asks, could you please elaborate on a specific example or case study which highlights the limitations of viewing cities through that lens and how embracing a different perspective can lead to more effective planning and development strategies, which you kind of just started to do right before we broke in, right? You started to mm -hmm. talk about case examples or case studies highlighting mm -hmm. why a city cannot be a work of art. Well, I mean, there are a lot of planning failures. I think uh, Peter Hall, mm -hmm. um, the, the urban theorist, uh, wrote a book called uh, "History of Urban Planning Failures." Right. Um, and so, I, you know, you might cons consult that mm -hmm. that book. I, you know, the the um, you know it, it it depends on how you define failure. If if you define failure straightforwardly as failing to achieve the objectives that were you know stated, <laughs> then yeah, then cities uh, that were uh, as Roberta was uh, mentioning earlier, that were planned on on a large scale, uh, like uh, like Brasilia was, and I, right. I said over you know it's been it's been sixty years or so, right. and so time has healed a lot of wounds there, mm -hmm. but uh, it was it was a place what was not a city for the first uh, decades because. The, um, the the uh, people who work for the government who, ha who had to be there. Brasilia, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's, it's you know the capital of Brazil is it's located on a on a plateau, very very far from Sao Paulo or from from Rio, mm -hmm. and so people would just on the weekends would leave. Right, there'd be it'd be deserted. It's kind of like Wall Street was, you know, right, right, uh, yeah. back in back in back in the eighties when before there was right. residential stuff. I, I had friends who would, would roller skate up and down Broad yeah. Street, <laughs> <laughs> so, which, which is not the case anymore. But it, so that's so, that was, was a, in Brasilia is a collection of famous designer buildings for the government. It's not a real city. It's a government. Yeah. Everybody's frozen to me. That's okay. I have a few questions. Um, I wish Roberta could hear me. Uh, this one's very interesting. Roberta, can you hear us? Because this is about the city in California, the proposed city. Oh, she's gone. Darn it. That's a really she's interesting. Back. Oh, she's back. Okay, Roberta. <laughs> can you hear me? The mega yes, city. Now I can. Okay, perfect. The mega city that you mentioned. Um, a person on the call is lives right near there. In California? Yes. And 
Oh, uh, she's asking. They they're calling it California Forever, and she said since it's located to a busy military base, the Travis Air Force Base. Could that be an example of an established outpost that may increase the feasibility of the development over time? I really wish you could hear me with I, that. I'm not, repeat that, Marie. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not hearing you clearly. Okay. So the developers named that outpost California Forever. And the girl, this woman on the our chat right now, who's on the lecture, said it's next to the Traverse, Traverse. Air Force Base, Travis Air Force Base. And she said because oh. of that, she said because of that, could it develop as an outpost over time because of the Air Force Base? Um, an Air Force Base is not a, enough to be, uh, to, to develop an economy of the city. Uh, are they going to start manufacturing airplanes there? It's an outpost. Um, it has the advantage of being near um, uh, uh, an, the, an airport, um, but that's not enough reason for a city. A city has to have its own purpose, right. its own economic activity. Now, if somebody were to the um, I'm going to start manufacturing planes. Mm -hmm. Right. That would be a purpose, manufacturing planes. Different from... San Francisco or Los Angeles, whatever, needs how uh, you know, that's it. Okay. Might be over. So, um, Roberta, we would we have another question for Sandy. Sandy, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a lot of interest here too in Scranton because of you know Jane Jacobs' connection to this city as her hometown. I'm. I'm wondering, I have a question really, then I have a follow-up from actually, I think it's a student. Um, Dark Ages Ahead was one of Jane's books, right? Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering her last, book. her last book, right? And she really does talk about coal mining in Pennsylvania and how this industry put all its eggs sort of in one basket. And then when that failed, we were left in the condition we were in. I'm just interested in, in that book at, from your perspective as an economist to think like, what what should we, should we reread it? What can we learn from that book? Dark Ages Ahead. No. Oh, yeah. Well, it's the most pessimistic book. I think, right, I think, yeah. Uh, uh, she's been characterized, and she characterized herself as an optimist, right? To right, right. Uh, she tended to, to uh, because of the, you know, she had a lot of, she had a lot of confidence in people taking initiative and and, and so forth. But she was looking at patterns. Uh, I, you know, it's my least favorite of her book, not necessarily because it's it's, um, it's pessimistic because you know, right. That that, it, that could be well deserved. Uh, it just it just seems to 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 not have the same coherence as as her other as her other books. Like that being said. Uh, that being said, I think one of the problems of a, a a city or a region that's dependent on a particular resource, and and this is true of of countries as well, that, you know, it's the resource. Economists call it the resource curse. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, you know you're you you have all your eggs in one basket. Right. And so yeah, uh, coal mining was very important after World War One. You know, there's a great demand for. Or during the war, I should say, uh, right. a great demand for for coal, and um, and then so a great uh, uh, investment, and then these places went went bust afterwards. I mean, you could say give a similar kind of story about Detroit, um, which hopefully is coming back now after uh, its its own doldrums. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean the the 
you know, one thing about, that's interesting about uh, J Jane's work, Jane Jacobs' work, is, is, is that it, it's scalable. That what she says right. about a neighborhood can also apply to a city, to also apply to a region. Uh, you know, uh, she says one of the things that help to generate uh, the diversity that's necessary for ec for economic uh, uh, development and innovation within the city. And she says this in, in Death and Life, um, is uh, multiple primary uses, more than one right. attractor into a neighborhood so that you have eyes on the street at different times of the day, promote safety and so forth. But this is also true at the regional level. Like you have to have more than one reason for people to live and work and uh, invest their lives as well as their money in right. a particular place. So if you have um, uh, uh, multiple industries, and I think Roberta mentioned this earlier about the difference between Manchester and Birmingham. Uh, I, I think it's Birmingham that was a little bit more diverse. Uh, I could be wrong. But anyway, that one one did much better than the other because of the industrial diversity. Right. Can I add so, something? So, yes. I, I know I, I, got, I was uh, cut out. Were you talking about dark age ahead? Yes, there was a question locally here. Um, about well, I, I do urge people to read it. Um, she predicted the housing bust of 08. Yep. What she says about education, that it's a credential, it's not a real education, is absolutely on the mark. It is pessimistic, but we are in a very pessimistic time. So I would not uh avoid it because it's pessimistic oh, I no, not it it, no. because no. it's real and right captures the reality right it was and that's well the question came here because of because so much we've talked about coal mining and, and you know this small region did have so much um of their resources into one really economy so i was just kind of interested that's from but Maria, you know, that's a very good example because what Jane's point is that when you count on one industry right. to be your savior, right. and, your, and which is what happened in Rochester, which she writes about, with Xerox closing out all new initiatives uh, by other electronic people, except Xerox was the only one. When you crowd out everything else or don't at least uh, make room and encourage it, that will die. That's what happened right. in Detroit. Detroit had been a very multiple, uh, a, a, a multifaceted economy before cars took right. over everything. So right. it's a very important lesson not to let one element, uh, you know, kind right. of... So it's, right. So it's all about it's still it's about creating the diversity. And that's what Sandy was, you know. So we have to wrap this up, but I have to just say I this our Roberta and Sandy said it was going to go very quickly, and it certainly did. Yeah. And you certainly could keep on talking about this. And I do really think this is fascinating, the economies of Jane's work that we don't typically think of. Like you said, Sandy, you went to that conference and you were such a small amount of people that were really talking about this, and it's mm -hmm. so embedded into her work and it, it just it just it's very obvious now that it's like it's yeah. still, we have so much to learn from it and yeah. jacobs point. herself said economics is you know, her main contribution right intellectual yeah. contribution was, was in economic yeah, right. theory particular economic development and we don't typically think about that so mm -hmm. i think that's why it was wonderful that i had you know we had roberta and you together to mm -hmm. to, and like this really is just the beginning of, of this like this conversation so Hold that book up there one more time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, this this book took a long time to write, but it but in a sense, it was low hanging fruit. Right? It's a book that you know somebody needed and, to write, and, and uh, hopefully was, there'll be more books. You know, uh, filling in my gaps, uh, criticizing me. Maybe Roberta will write one. Uh, oh, Sorry, conversation. Yes, yes. So, um, thank you, both of you. It went too thank fast. You. I will save all of these questions because there are tons in the q a and i will we will copy them and send them off to you and roberta just so you have them and if we sure. want to answer them um again these <clears throat> talks will be up on our youtube channel um in a day mm -hmm. or two and uh, our next lecture will be on tuesday which is different for us april 9th at 4 p.m with kimberly dowdell who is the 
current president of the American Institute of Architects. And we're going to have a mm -hmm. panel discussion, women in architecture and with a bunch of our students and uh, alumni who are out in the field. So um, we'll be moving on. But Sandy, this has just been terrific. And again, thank well, you. the book is available. Thank you, me. Roberta. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. Thank you for the center and everybody, all the participants, all the, the people who yeah. tuned in. Thank you. Thoughts on this one. Okay. Best to everyone. Bye-bye.